Greetings in this last little mini section. I'm going to give you a couple of mini lectures. I'm going to concentrate primarily on political culture, but touch a little bit on uh, some other what I call uh, loose ends uh, and uh, federalism uh, interest groups and uh, a couple of, uh, of public policy challenges that I think that Germany faces. So if you follow along in your notes at the top of the German political culture, section, I noticed that uh, that I have a mistake uh, early in the note. So uh, I will uh, uh, read along with me and then I will uh, will make some comments on this. So uh, in the notes, it says Germans, as I mentioned in the historical section, were subjects with an authoritarian political culture. Remember, there isn't even really a uh, meaningful attempt uh, at democracy to the Weimar Republic. And the Weimar Republic failed uh, miserably. Uh, and so after World War II, democracy was transplanted uh, into the 10 West German states. Uh, the mistake, as you can see, is it says democracy was transplanted into West Germany in 1940. Uh, that should read 1949, not 1940. 1940 was still the Nazi uh, Germany era. Uh, and later, uh, into the East German states, there were six of them, uh, when reunification occurred in 1990. So democracy was transplanted externally uh, on both the West and the East Germans. So uh, the West Germans uh, democracy was transplanted uh, by the Allies, uh, primarily uh, the United States, but also Britain and France. And then the East Germans uh, had democracy externally placed on them uh, by the West Germans. Now, there are a couple of implications for this, and Roskin doesn't make these implications, so these are coming from me, uh, not for him. But when I look at uh, what this means uh, in terms of uh, even voting today, for example, uh, one significant result, and you're likely to see this question uh, on the exam, one significant result of this is that voters in the six eastern states have weaker party identification than voters in the Western states. Uh, we also know that the uh, Eastern voters uh, are more interested in material equality, which has given the left party, uh, this would be, uh, the left party would be kind of a aggregation of uh, the former communists that used to exist uh, in the East German states. Uh, and the Socialist Party had a division, uh, and some of the more leftist uh, uh, elements of the Socialist Party left <laughs> the Social Democrats and joined the Left Party. So uh, we've talked about how new parties sometimes form uh, because of defections out of a party. The Social Democrats, uh, remember, were uh, aided when there was a tremendous split in the Labor Party. Uh, and some of the uh, more right-wing element uh, of the Labor Party left, believing that uh, the Labor Party was being dominated by the more liberal wing of the party, and so uh, they looked for a new home. And that, that happened with the socialists uh, in finding uh, the left party and leaving the Social Democrats. Uh, I would say, though, that, that even though you think of maybe the former communists uh, are perhaps, uh, uh, you know, are, are they a threat to the system? Uh, the research suggests that that's not true, that uh, democracy is now strongly supported by voters throughout the country, and even those who consider themselves uh, socialists and, uh, and, and even communists uh, support uh, the democratic process, democratic institutions. Uh, I think that the people even in the North have seen that there has been uh, a tremendous uh, resurgence and resurrection in terms of the standard of living uh, of people in the North under the democratic regime. And so uh, the system is, is well supported. Uh, uh, maybe uh, if you wanted to argue, is there a systems challenge? It might be from the extreme nationalist parties uh, on the far right. But uh, overall, uh, even though there is a wide continuum uh, in terms of the political uh, perspectives of German voters, 
they do tend to support democracy. The second thing that I would note under German political culture, and this is actually one of uh, my favorite things to discuss in class uh, when I'm doing face-to-face -face over the last couple of years uh, using Roskin. Uh, I really uh, like the introduction of this concept uh, in the chapter by the German sociologist Mannheim. Uh, he has an interesting thesis, and that is that great events of young adulthood uh, shape a political generation. So when I was thinking about this in my life, uh, for my grandparents, uh, the political generation, the great events that shaped them were the Great Depression, uh, and to a lesser extent, World War II. Uh, for my father, it was World War II in Korea, and for me, it was the Cold War. Uh, I asked my daughter uh, what great political event stands out for her. Uh, my daughter is uh, 32 years old now, and, and without batting an eye, she said it was the terrorist attacks at 9-11 uh, that uh, come to her. So uh, I, I, I do think there there is something to this. Uh, this can be a good thing and a bad thing. Unfortunately, uh, we see great events, and sometimes uh, when we see a future event, uh, we think it may be a replaying of that event, and it may be uh, very, very different. I know, for example, uh, the British uh, made a mistake in the 1956 Suez crisis. Anthony Eden, who, uh, for him, the the earth-shattering event of his young adulthood was, of course, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler. And Anthony Eden, who was the foreign minister at the time, made the mistake uh, of seeing Nasser uh, as being kind of a modern-day Hitler. And uh, Nasser was more of a uh, of a nationalist uh, and uh, anti-colonialist, and he did not have uh, totalist ambitions like Hitler. And there were some miscalculations uh, in that crisis. Uh, I, I, I wrote some uh, other things uh, that I want you to follow, and I'll talk about this a bit. I, I had the good fortune in uh, 1972 as a 14 year old to have several discussions, uh, primarily uh, with a, a German man. Uh, he and his uh, wife uh, were, were a bit older. They had. Uh, been in Germany during World War II, had grown up in the Weimar Republic, um, and he worked for my stepdad, and he, he knew that I was really interested in history, and so it was really intriguing uh, that uh, he, he discussed uh, World War II kind of from a German perspective, and, you know, he, he wasn't a Nazi. In fact, he he was a socialist, so he uh, uh, and his family were kind of leftists. And so I asked a question that if, I guess maybe even older people would ask, but at 14, I kind of asked, well, you know, if you didn't like Hitler and if uh, uh, you, know, you, 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 had, uh, you had voted against him and your, your dad had voted against him and you guys were socialists, you know, well, why, why were you fighting for the Nazis? And, he said that he wasn't, that uh, he didn't like Hitler, uh, but in this case, just as his father had fought uh, in the First World War, uh, he, he was fighting uh, for his country. Uh, he, he did admit that uh, after he found out uh, about the grim atrocities that uh, had been perpetrated by Hitler and the Nazis, he felt guilty about the behavior of his country talked about some of the atrocities that German soldiers had uh, committed, uh, particularly uh, during the uh, the Soviet invasion, and he spoke very graphically about the atrocities of Soviet soldiers in Berlin uh, at the end uh, of World War II. And uh, he asked at the end of the war, and I know Roskin brings this concept up. It's uh, something that was discussed uh, a lot by older Germans, uh, perhaps I don't think very much uh, by younger Germans, uh, this notion about whether the atrocities that were committed uh, by the Nazis in terms of genocide and the final solution and the liquidation of the Jews and 
um, that that perhaps his his country wasn't uh, a, a normal country. And of course, uh, while this is uh, horrific and one of the most gruesome uh, atrocities in world history, we know that people around the world have committed uh, great atrocities. Certainly, uh, perhaps not on this scale, but uh, you can certainly think about uh, the atrocities committed by Joseph Stalin and, and, and Mao and Idi Amin in Uganda. And some would argue that if you take a look at the U.S. government's uh, atrocities in terms of promoting slavery uh, and, uh, of course, the treatment of, of Native Americans, the internment of Japanese Americans, uh, Jim Crow uh, and segregation, the uh, widespread lynching uh, of black people uh, in the southern part of this country. Uh, certainly, uh, the United States has had its share of atrocities, and uh, one of the things that uh, is intriguing to me is that while we were fighting this great evil, uh, Nazi Germany, we, we fought World War II with segregated uh, military units. And to me, that's, uh, that's kind of a crime of our character. Certainly, uh, I'm not equating that with, with mass genocide, but certainly I think for a country promoting itself as the, you know, the land of the free, uh, certainly this notion that, uh, at least in terms of race, uh, we were far from a colorblind society uh, ourselves. If you go down to B, uh, and this ties into this political generations discussion, uh, Germans after World War II were great admirers of the United States. Uh, and your book points out that over time, younger Germans have increasingly become cynical uh, of America. Um, older uh, Germans like uh, like the old German soldier uh, believed that the genocide really prevented Germany from being a normal country. Uh, one of the policy choices made by Germany after World War II, as Roskin notes, and I have uh, what what I'm calling stars there, one of the policy choices made by uh, Germany was paying 60 billion dollars or 60 billion euros, that should be, not dollars, uh, in reparations for this atrocity. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm, I, I wrote these, uh, these notes, I'm recording this lecture. World War II has been over for 75 years in Europe uh, as of the time that I wrote these notes on May 8th. I'm actually recording uh, on May 12th. Um, I would say that today Germany is a normal country. Uh, democracy is well rooted despite the significant political differences between German voters. Uh, there is a, a nice unimodal moderate distribution uh, of the electorate. The vast majority of voters are moderate with a right leaning uh, electorate. And we've seen that with the Christian Democrats uh, winning the vast majority of elections. Yes, the Social Democrats have won uh, occasionally, but the Christian Democrats have usually been the largest party. Um, so the the electorate is right leaning, but but is clearly, uh, in my opinion, moderate. Uh, I do fear the uh, the rise of a right wing nationalist group in the country, which uh, I will fully admit. Uh, uh, I never uh, expected to, to rise in my lifetime again in Germany. Uh, but despite this uh, one kind of alarm bell, uh, I do agree with Roskin that I do not see a repeat of the Weimar Republic. Uh, I do not believe uh, that this democracy uh, will fade away. In fact, I would argue uh, that this German democracy is one of the stable pillars uh, of, of Europe right now, and that while right-wing nationalism has arisen throughout uh, Europe, uh, and there is a party now represented in the Bundestag that is a right-wing nationalist party, uh, I do believe uh, that Germany is likely to be a pillar upholding democracy rather than overturning it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next mini-lecture about this.